the mysteries of uh, Linux. Um, so I just wasted 10 minutes. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I wanted to start out. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. And I'm sorry about my inability to get technology to work. Uh, <laughs> but uh, sometimes it's a mystery. I think uh, oftentimes all this stuff we use works by accident. And, uh, you know, so um, now Mike and I go back a long way. So it's really interesting to hear Mike discovering things. And I feel like I've discovered some similar things. I uh, And I know that test driven has changed me. And a couple of notes I took uh, from Mike is, you know, consequences. Um, what's the consequence of this next change? And, you know, when you go and do a bunch of things all at once, and then you spend, uh, you know, a day trying to figure out what you did wrong when you did five steps of a process that's supposed to lead to a new web page coming up, and you debug it all day, and then the next day you get to debug all the things you changed that you shouldn't have changed. Um, Mike's talking about consequences there. Uh, now, I always try to look for this natural problem-solving path. Um, there might not be one, but so you invent one. But uh, if I don't do the thing, what happens? And can I move my code a little bit closer and closer and closer to the target? So um, I never anticipated that that's what uh, Test Driven was really going to do. And it's it's moved into a lot of my, uh, my life. So it actually has kind of changed uh, my life as well. But so, Mike, great talk. Thanks for that. Um, let's see now. Uh, I can see you can see part of my screen. I'm going to probably have to adjust this a little bit. So give me one second now that I'm seeing my cropped screen behind me. And I got to get out of the way a little bit. So uh, I'm going to talk to you today about technical excellence. And um, this talk started about 10 years ago when the Scrum people invited me to come and talk at their Scrum gathering. And I said, well, I've got some problems with Scrum. Is it okay if I tell you about it? And they said, well, sure, that'd be fine. Just be nice. And it's like, okay, I can do that. But at any rate, uh, technical excellence um, as a, uh, well, it's just as a young guy, um, you know, computer programming is just about typing. I saw this and thought, stay away. I don't want to be typing. This is the last thing I want to do. You know, it's like it wasn't wasn't cool to type back when I went to high school. So I tried to avoid computers. And then I ran into a calculus class where the professor made us do some programming. And it turned out it was fun. And I realized someone would repay me. And that's kind of how I got started on down this path. And uh, the day I walked into my job, somebody handed me this uh, page out of a spec. And I became an embedded systems engineer. I had a little electronics background with my EECS degree. But uh, so I got involved in embedded systems. And back in those days, you know, we got to toggle in the bits to boot the computer. Uh, that was always a fun and not error prone task at all. Um, kind of primitive. If you want to erase your program, you had to shine UV light on it. And that would erase your program. And you had some tools kind of clunky. You could probably shoot a, a 30 out six at this and wouldn't do any harm to it. And you debug your code with logic analyzers and maybe printed out output. Well, if we had a spare serial port to print out debug messages, that would have been an amazing innovation, but we didn't have any such thing uh, back then. Um, now, this Agile thing, you know, so 22, 21 and a half years ago is probably when I met Mike uh, at the bar in, uh, sorry, Mike, telling the real, the true story here, at the bar in uh, Deerfield, Illinois, Extreme Programming Immersion 1. So back in those days, I'm learning from these guys. Uh, there's Kent and Ron Jeffries, Ward Cunningham, and Martin Fowler. They were all at this, and Mike was there too, and we're learning from these guys. It was really, uh, uh, Mike knew a lot more about it than I did at this point. I was kind of a super newbie, and Mike was uh, maybe about a year into it already. But uh, extreme programming, and extreme programming is, uh, you know, kind of what I've put my arms around as an uh, important thing to my, to uh, the way I develop and kind of the way that I work a lot of technical things. Um, this Agile Manifesto thing that I uh, was invited to, Bob Martin, uh, who I worked with and have known for a long time, we were lifelong friends, uh, professional lifelong friends. He said, James, do you want to go to the Lightweight Method Summit in Snowbird, Utah? And well, you know, a younger James said, oh, uh, where? Yeah, okay, I could make it. We're going skiing, yeah, I can do that. 
Um, and at the time of the Angel Manifesto, um, this was a very popular book, right? Managing the software process. And this said some words to the effect that made us think anyway, that um, if you just had a better process, the people wouldn't matter, right? It wouldn't be a people problem. It would be a process problem. You just have a better process. And I kind of came into uh, extreme programming with this on my mind. And, uh, you know, there were companies, ones that we were consulting with that said, well, you know, the coding is not a valuable skill. Uh, we're going to do all the design work here in the United States. And then we're going to email those designs. Were they using email back then? Yeah, of course, they're using email back then uh, to other places where we can get that work done more cheaply. And, uh, you know, there's plug replaceable programming units. And uh, I don't know if this was Watt's intention is that uh, the people didn't matter. But this is what the industry was hearing, better processes. And I saw extreme programming as a... Uh, a better process because we are suffering a lot from defects and delays and frustration. And uh, so here's this Agile Manifesto thing. I just bring this up uh, because the first statement was like kind of mind blowing for me because here I'm with all these technical guys. I'm expecting to be talking about technology and they're talking about people. And um, that's what the first statement was about and the puzzle that is people. And uh, this is, you know, a lot of Agile now is focused on the people side. But you know me, I'm just an engineer and I'm kind of looking at how do we do the work? And that's really what drew me into this. And I'm not saying the people side is not important. We'll come back to that, but let's talk about the engineering side. A, a phenomenon happened. Uh, somebody offered a certification and people started taking these scrum classes. I'm sure there's some of you out there that are uh, certified scrum develop, um, masters or some such thing. And so here's the first ever class. It was held at our uh, organization in uh, the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, Ken Schwaber's there and Mike Cohen, some others. And, uh, you know, Scrum has gone a long way. There's hundreds of thousands of certified Scrum masters. This is old data. You know, I was looking for the up-to-date data, but this old data will work. There's 300 and some thousand certified Scrum masters in whatever year this was, 2013, 2014. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, Ken, what's Scrum supposed to do? Well... Uh, Scrum exposes the inadequacy and dysfunction of an organization. Uh, and uh, so you can find your problems, right? This is about continuous improvement. Make problems transparent so you can fix them. And, you know, there's something we were studying back then in the 80s, which sounded really similar to that uh, philosophy, that approach, which is total quality management was the name it was known by before. Uh, then it changes its name every decade. Six Sigma, Lean Six Sigma, whatever they're calling it these days. Um, but involved in it is the problem solving cycle, right? A plan, do, check, act, PDCA. There's a number of different acronyms that surround this cycle, but it's all about what problem are we solving? Hmm, would this work? Let's go try it. Oh, it worked. Uh, let's institute that. Oh, it didn't work. Let's not institute it, right? So here's a cycle. Uh, good idea, Scrum. But what are most people in Scrum doing these days, it seems? they're doing the do cycle okay there somebody goes off to scrum master school and uh comes back and has people doing this iterative cycle we're going to get into some of the consequences of this but you know I, i'm still kind of seeing that the world is blind to what's happening and uh, we're following this too many people uh, end up following this dogma of scrum right dogma followers not so many problem solvers so I'm seeing this do cycle in Scrum, and what could we do different? And here is a, a book I ran into in uh, researching for doing a talk like this and the debrief. I, I mean, I'm interested in uh, aircraft and fighter pilots and such. My father was a World War II fighter pilot. And so I wanted to find out how did pilots go through continuous improvement? And this uh, author of this book uh, describes what his path to becoming a fighter pilot and how if he didn't learn to fix problems in himself, in his abilities, in the problems of flying an aircraft, he never would have been able to fly. He said, you got two chances to get better at something. And if you couldn't continually learn and get better, there'd be a problem. So here's a problem that the Air Force had, um, refueling. High stress for the pilot of the plane being refueled. You got to fly behind this little point there, right? And nose the airplane into that so you can, and you might be low on 
on fuel and you might have just come up from a, a battle. So you're fatigued and this is a hard thing to do. And so they wanted to solve this problem. And now fighter pilots are tough. You know, it's like, no, I can do it. I'm sure, uh, you know, my dad was uh, a mild mannered guy, but, you know, lots of uh, special breed. Um, well, they came up with a new solution. Why don't you go fly formation behind the tanker and let the tanker boom operator worry about filling your plane up. So now the pilot gets to react, uh, relax for a little bit. And here we go. Um, they, they made an improvement on that process. And so what's Scrum supposed to do? Oh yeah, Scrum's supposed to do this continuous improvement. And uh, how are we doing at that? Um, about 10 years ago, oh, let's see, before I get into that one, Here's an interesting article by uh, a guy named David Dunning, I'm sure, you know, famous guy, but he surveyed some uh, companies about how they're doing. And 32% of the engineers at a company said that they were in the top 5%. And another another company said 42, had 42% of the engineers think they were in the top 5%. And I love this statement he makes here is, um, so much for being lonely at the top. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, so. 40% think they're in the top 5%. And uh, by my math, uh, no, no, it's not really scientific math, but 87.5% of them are definitely wrong because um, they can't all be in that top 5%. And uh, a guy that I know, a friend of mine, um, online friend, uh, wrote this article. Well, you've seen the Dreyfus skill acquisition model before. And you know, you go through a progression. There's uh, uh, being a novice and an advanced beginner and starting to uh, become competent, and you get good at something you're doing, and then maybe you go on to become an expert, right? Now, people doing software development, you can do a lot of amazing things. You can get things to work and, uh, and uh, you know, that other people can't do. Programming is really hard. And uh, what uh, my friend observed in his own trying to learn how to bowl was that he initially was really good at bowling, but he plateaued because he had some fundamentals wrong. And so he, he self-diagnosed himself as an expert beginner. And to get good at bowling, he had to go relearn bowling and lower his score and work his way back up to take the top away. And one of the things that he thinks happens to developers is that we get this idea that we're an expert and that we know everything. Now, there was a long time ago um, when I got out of school, I kind of thought, you know, a new field, software development, I kind of thought I knew everything, but... <laughs> I got to tell you, um, you don't know how much you don't know <laughs> until you think that once and then you start to learn stuff and realize, you know, there's a lot to learn in our world. Uh, getting the app to work is not easy, right? Something I would call uh, in tongue in cheek, the aptitude test. See how I spell it over there, right? Uh, if you can get the app to work, uh, you might have an aptitude to become a, a, pro a professional programmer. But getting the app to work app to work is just a start, right? There's a lot more to it than just getting the app to work. Now, how's our industry doing at improving over these 20 years of the of, of Agile? I know we're at a test-driven development conference, but for me, test-driven is at the core of it. To be successful, you need it. And so that's why I'm taking you through this story here. Alistair planned a meeting about 10 years ago of people that were in the first Snowbird thing. And of course, it was the right place, so I had to go back. And this is a more planned out meeting, but we did come up with some ideas about what to fix. And the number one thing to fix was demand technical excellence. And for that, we, you know, we have to be willing to change ourselves and to help others change. There's some other points. I don't remember them, what they are, but these two really stuck with me. And I, these were ones that I had voted on as being an important thing about our industry. Um, now, we know what Ken says Scrum is about, um, but what's really happening? <laughs> well, unfortunately, what Ken says, people change Scrum to meet their inadequacies. Now, that makes me think Ken is saying, don't change Scrum, but I don't think that's what he means. I can't really speak for him, but I don't think that's what he means. Um, you know, try Scrum and then have adopt it, but um, you know, we're still having some of the same problems. Right. I, I'm sure a lot of people's lives are better, but some are still suffering. And if I look at uh, this picture here, move over a little bit, we're iterating. And, you know, when you, you start out in Scrum, they just say, start iterating. Oh, and I'm not using the S word, sprint. I'll show you in a second why not. 
but I'm not using the S word. So when you iterate, if you save your test till the end, what starts to happen? Well, you know, oh, at the bottom of this waterfall, um, there's no real problems, right? We're just looking for bugs. It's nice and peaceful. There I am under the waterfall, just enjoying life. And uh, well, wait, actually, the bottom of the waterfall is more, more like this, not that peaceful time down there. You're getting crushed. All your options have been used up, right? The pressure's on. Everybody's upset, bothered. They want to release those fires Mike was talking about, brush fires. Uh, where do the brush fires start? Oh, look, there's a name for this thing at the end of all these iterations, hardening. And I know a few years ago it was popular to talk about the hardening sprint. Ooh, now I use that word, sorry. Um, the hardening sprint, uh, where you go and start to, well, finish your testing. What happens during that hardening sprint? Well, you know, there's some little brush fires and we put them out. And then someone says, you know, that might have been the last bug. <laughs> and then, well, um, you know what happens after that? You put that one out and what happens next? Well, um, it seems like the firefighting goes on. Now, these guys have all the latest debugging and firefighting equipment available. Uh, and they're struggling, trying to get the fires out. And, you know, here we are. Um, the fire is coming under control. Um, things don't look so great. And why does this happen? Um, oh, yeah, don't worry. We're 90% done with this bug fix. Can you really say that? Uh, you know, hacking in new features, chasing bugs, that's not what I would consider technical excellence, right? We'd like to prevent those things. Um, Jeff Sutherland says the biggest problem is people can't ship a product after every sprint. Ah, there's that word again. Um, because everybody's busy doing the do cycle and they're not doing the improvement part. Oh yeah, sure, you're running your retrospectives, but what's really being focused on? What's our velocity? What's the due date? Can we get this done? Here's somebody ringing the bell. Come on, let's get back to work. A question I have for you. If you're in a Scrum or Agile environment, you're changing the cadence of delivery, right? To, well, now DevOps and such, continuous delivery. But if you're every other week trying to deliver or every week delivering, you're changing the cadence of development. Have you changed how you do engineering of your products? Have you changed how you do the development of the products? Not just the delivery, the development. <clears throat> so I'd say uh, incremental management and planning without incremental engineering skills is a recipe recipe for pain. And um, excuse me, one second. Really? <laughs> Hi, it's been totally quiet around here all morning, <laughs> but uh, due to my being late. Okay, so uh, I'm going to propose a marriage of, you know, what a lot of the world is doing right now, which is iterative development a la Scrum and the engineering practices of extreme programming. Uh, I wonder, how is that marriage doing so far? There's somewhat of a marriage already, if you will go look at uh, the Scrum world, there is a certified Scrum developer. Uh, and if we look at the numbers, on this day when I got the numbers from whoever it was at the Scrum Alliance that gave them to me, there were 333,000 uh, Scrum masters. And there were 54 and some thousand Scrum developers. Hmm, interesting. I wonder what that means. Can we infer anything from those numbers? Well, yeah, obviously it takes six scrum masters to master one CSD. Oh, of course, that's a conclusion to draw. Um, now, the developers kind of feel like when they send off their junior person to go to scrum master school, or maybe their manager to go to scrum master school, they come back and they start to feel like they're micromanaged. Now you have to have a daily meeting instead of a weekly meeting, right? So you get this micromanagement. And then they're talking about these sprints and you know we've seen the olympics this is why i don't like to use the s word you see what happens in the olympics and it's not just the ladies that can't uh, survive and have you know after they've given it everything the guys are laying on the ground too and then somebody wants to help them up and have them run another sprint okay so i kind of object to that um and you know 
focus on how much can we deliver this iteration, right? Focus on this thing and committing. I liked how Mike talking about these commitments and such, but uh, this person actually didn't know that they could have delivered this plywood to the job site in probably five small trips instead of one big trip. This didn't work out so well. And you know, we're wondering why uh, the projects don't always end so well. <clears throat> so maybe we're not so good at bringing some of these ideas into the world. I, I was on uh, Quora and I, a, a question came across to me and I read this question, this uh, question in a nutshell, why do a lot of developers dislike Agile? And uh, well, if you went and read the answers here and there were a lot of answers about how these developers hate Agile. And if you read about what they were doing, um, you found out what they were doing was not really Agile at all. They were doing something that someone called Agile. They were iterating, but the engineers had no idea how to actually do iterative development. And so it was very painful. Um, I wrote a little reply to it. And just to show about the popularity of how the world sees the negative side of iterating and not being ready to iterate, they don't understand maybe that part of it. Uh, there's hundred, half a million likes on the negative side of Agile when I looked at it. And well, I was kind of surprised that actually 100,000 people pushed like on mine, but uh, that was kind of nice. But the bad news is the dislikes of iterative de development a la Agile are bigger than the likes. Mm, it's kind of a problem. So why? Okay, what's missing? And uh, I was out to dinner and uh, with some business people. And as things go, I work my way onto the soapbox. And, and um, I said to the person I'm having dinner with, uh, you know, people are only doing the half, the easy half of Agile. And he says, well, what's, what's the hard half? I said, well, the hard half is a technical excellence side, of course, you know, the part that, I'm, that I've got an affinity to. Uh, he goes, no, that's, that's not the hard half. The hard half is the people. It's like, oh, shoot. There's three halves. Make room, technical excellence, and iterative planning. We've got to respect people, too. And it's like, oh, gosh, Kent and Ward and all the guys at the Agile Manifesto meeting thinking about um, the people side really is so critical because we have to we have to respect people's abilities to get this work done. And uh, you need all three of these halves to be successful. And so you might have, well, you've seen this slide now um, here. If we get started in iterative development and just, I mean, not development, iterative management, it's going to feel bad. It's going to hurt. You're going to be scared. It's, you're going to wonder why no one cares about quality work anymore. Uh, when it, back in the old days, when we were teaching extreme programming immersions, we tried teaching top down, I think the first time, teach the planning and work our way into the uh, technical practices, test driven development, et cetera. Uh, and it was kind of a pain because people didn't know what they were trying to guess about uh, in the planning. So we reversed that and we were much more successful in our extreme programming immersions, starting developers out on day one with writing some code, iterating, getting small things done, working on a story, not knowing where the story came from, and then later in the week, introducing the planning cycle. It was easy once the people, well, let's say easy, easier once people had an idea of what iterative engineering was all about. So, um, you know, how's, the, how's it going now? I do a lot of, uh, when I teach a test-driven development class, I survey the people that are coming to my class just to find out where they are in their path. And, you know, how much time do you spend? You know, these are just numbers people make up of your given day coding. How much of your time is spent coding, you know, do, adding value? How much time is spent testing? How much time is spent debugging? And you see there's some really high debug numbers here. And then you'll see one lonely person down there that doesn't do much debugging. That's usually the person who, you know, was a self-starter on TDD. They had some, they had learned it somewhere else. They were brought into the company. They're having success with it. Now they want to spread the good word to other people. So this is a typical uh, survey result on my, uh, on my survey. Here's some, another survey question. And Mike was talking about waiting 
for builds and my tolerance for uh, when I'm in TDD zone uh, is much lower than Mike's. I know Mike was saying he doesn't want to go much more than 10 minutes. Um, there's a lot of situations where 10 seconds might be a long time. Uh, you know, if I'm waiting for a build, 10 seconds might be a long time. And when we're doing a test-driven development training class and we have a five second build, which is usually way faster than anything anybody has in their production environments, uh, we have a five second build and they start to feel like to them that that's long. If it takes seven seconds, it feels like it's long. But so here are the results from my uh, informal survey of people that are about to take my class. Um, some people are spending up to a day waiting for a build. Uh, many people are in the over a minute to, well, there's less than half the people have less than a minute wait. <laughs> and that's gonna be a problem if you wanna stay focused and fast feedback is about staying focused. And like Mike said, interruptibility. I know how irritable I get on some tasks where they, I do have some tasks still that can't be interrupted um, or that when they're interrupted, it does send me way back. Uh, we'll talk about that another time. But uh, so here are, you know, uh, people are waiting and waiting is a thing you can do it. Sometimes your production build okay, but while you're working, inventing something, you want to keep this cycle time low. And I ask people, how do they test their code? And well, they go through debug logs. You know, I wish I would have had one of those back in 1979. Um, we look at printed output inspect printed output. We go singles, we deploy our code and go see if it works. I do this on my website sometimes. Um, <clears throat> and there are uh, single stepping through the debugger, right? Oh yeah, all these things. Oh yeah, and if a uh, core question, how often do you use a debugger? And here's a person who answered, well, I use it every time I code. Otherwise, how would I know that my code is doing what it's supposed to do? Well, there's another way, by the way. All these tools, right? Oh, that. Those big logic analyzers now are a little dongle hanging off your computer. Uh, so the tools have gotten much more advanced than the ones I was using back in the old days, but congratulations. Yeah, here goes the fireworks. You are using state-of-the-art 1979 development practices, something I call, well, I'd call it if I could click that, debug later programming. Oh yeah, well now don't run off and put this on your resume, okay? Uh, let's work on test driven. Let's put that on your resume, not debug later programming. Um, John Gall, if you haven't read this book, it's a really good book. Uh, your program will have bugs and they will surprise you when you find them. So here is the uh, the guys from the commit strip enjoying their party. They fixed, you know, 19, 1,293 bugs. Oh, and here comes a bug spoiling the party. I'm going to put down the champagne. Uh, one of the lead developers picks up the samurai sword and hacks the bug. I mean, engineers a solution to the defect. And now they're ready to relax. Oh, good. We finally got the last one. And of course, they are surrounded. And some of these bugs are very confident that they're never going to be found. They're, they're smirking and, well, you never know which one's going to strike next. You know, where do these bugs come from? Hmm. Uh, oh, yeah, it was somebody else that did it for sure. Uh, are you sure? Can we take some responsibility here? Um, well, let's, for starters, let's start managing the bugs. Well, you know, actually, I'd rather not manage the bugs. I'd like to prevent them. And, you know, I like to consider that test-driven is a way to prevent bugs. So I don't need one of these state-of-the-art bug categorization processes. I'd rather just not have any. Now, it's a... It's a tall order to get to, but it's something that we should strive for at any rate. <clears throat> and then you'll hear in the news about glitches. And this word glitch really bothers me because, you know, when you see glitch in something, it's like, oh, well, we couldn't possibly understand the cause for that glitch. Okay, well, um, I'd like to consider that, you know, there's a problem and we need to admit the problem. So all you developers, stand up with me, okay? Stand up with me, raise your right hand, and repeat after me. I am a programmer and I write bugs. I'm, I can't hear you, but uh, if you were to like tweet that, 
Okay, here's the, uh, uh, you could tweet that to, uh, uh, what is it, pound TDD conf and hashtag I write bugs. Okay, love to see you guys admitting that there's a problem. Because if you can admit there's a problem, then there's something we can do about it. And when we do development in a big step, okay, and uh, go start testing it. By the way, we test in small steps, very interesting. And we debug in small steps. You have no problem with small steps once you're debugging. And there's no other way at that point. Um, what do you find? You find defects, just not all of them. And so it's not our fault, right? Um, yeah, well, actually, it is our fault we put them there. So here is debug later programming taken apart. Okay, if you're a physicist, I apologize for using physics here, but it kind of looks like a physics uh, timing diagram. And so you make a mistake uh, and then time goes by and someone discovers the mistake. And now we've got to find the root cause. Now the bug isn't a bug until the root cause is found, right? And then once you find it, once there's a bug's been discovered, now you go find the cause. Um, when did you put that bug in there? Oh, you didn't. Someone else did. Old code like Mike was talking about. Unintended consequences. The new features all worked. It's only the old features that are broken now. Um, you know, you finally track down that problem. How long does it take to find a bug? Yeah, well, could take quite a long time. The fix might be real easy. And now what happens when you fix it? <laughs> well, lots of times other bugs come to the funeral when you fix it. And you're going to have to find them the hard way too. So, uh, yeah, I'd rather do something different. And Dr. Edsker Dykstra has a suggestion for us. If you want to be more effective programmers, you should discover you shouldn't waste your time debugging. You should not introduce bugs to start with. Hmm. Now, Dr. Dykstra had in mind ideas of formalized proofs and such. I think this the path to this in our day and age is small steps and test-driven development. I used to think it was test-driven development all by itself, <laughs> but small steps are also part of it. That was kind of a something that really uh, evolved. You know, practicing TDD helps you see, like Mike was saying, other things about uh, the way to work. And the small steps are one of the really powerful things. You get yourself in trouble with it uh, by taking too big of a step. Go back and find the smaller step that works. I remember Kent saying, well, you've come to peace with a, a step size. And if you ever make one too big, you know there are small steps that will help you get back, get your code working. Right? And that's a, a non-elegant um, paraphrasing of what Ken was, Kent was saying. But back to this marriage of XP and Scrum. So what is XP? Uh, well, it's a, as an engineer, it focuses on engineering practices. And there are Characterized by cranking the volume up, you know, turning the volume up. Ken, Ken said to 10, but, you know, now after, uh, what is it, spinal tap, we have to crank them up to 11. And there's different practices here. Here in the core of extreme programming is are the practices around test-driven development and other technical practices. I'm not going to take you through those. Uh, but test-driven development, as people in our conference know, some of you might be new to it, write a test, watch it fail, make it pass, refactor, repeat. You change your mind, clean your code up. And, you know, what are we trying to uh, get help with? Are we going to have these pressure drownings underneath the waterfall here? Are we going to be trapped down there? Well, maybe less. All right. We're hoping to be spending less time down there. What if wor your world could turn from the pressure of those dates uh, being crushed at the bottom of the waterfall, those integration points and such, into a fast moving stream. All right, so let's go look at how that might work. So uh, by the way, <laughs> you're human, you're going to continue to make mistakes. And uh, when I started, when I started, before I started test driven development, I actually thought I was good at programming. <laughs> and uh, well, no, you actually don't, you're not that good at it. Uh, every time you try to do something programming, you make mistakes. Uh, if I were to count them, I could count them per minute, not per hour, not other ways. Uh, you know, my typing skills aren't great because I told you the story about the typing already. But uh, I make mistakes frequently. Now, with test driven, the mistake is right in my face, right? So I can't ignore it. And when did I put the problem in? I just put it in 
within the last few minutes so I can find the cause. So if I get a new test to pass and I break seven other tests, I, I can't celebrate that new test. I got to back out the change for the one new test that passed and preserve the prior seven because existing features like Mike was saying are way more valuable than your new feature. Uh, I, I know some, uh, some of my clients work in uh, telecom and radio communications. And if they add some new capability that no one has or uses yet, and then break, you know, how call, some call processing feature works, uh, that's not going to be, a, that's not a good thing. Um, let me just say, now, finding the problem and fixing it could be quite easy now, and you got this tight feedback loop. And so here we are, our fast moving stream. It's not all the tests, and then all the development, it's cycles small steps. That picture Mike drew of the uh, the walk, it looked like that walk we took, Mike, when we were working in uh, Shenzhen that, that night and we went out uh, uh, to play pool, right? Uh, yeah, that walk is how you get between those two points, all right? Uh, small steps, firm footing each step of the way. And then when I'm working with new people to test driven, they say, well, you know, I already know what I'm doing. I've got 10 years experience. And sometimes I wonder if we're getting the same experience year after year. Are we doing that improvement? Are we seeing that the way we're working, there's something else we could do? I know I spent 20 years of my uh, career. Well, I did learn stuff throughout the career, but I didn't change how I programmed over those 20 years, not in any great extent. I wrote code and then tried to figure out what was wrong with it. Yeah, I'm already an expert beginner. Yeah, okay, so now I wonder, is your team doing test-driven development? Uh, do you create unit tests? Um, um, you know, you can write tests after, but it's way, it's nowhere near as much fun as writing them as you go. And um, I forget what Mike called it, but there is uh, that feedback loop, right? Uh, what was it? The rhythm, Mike? Is that what you're talking about? The rhythm of reward, right? If we're getting regular rewards, that's better than a big reward having to wait too long for it. So you get lots of wins. Every time you sit down, you get some wins. Now, you got to have unit tests. So if you can't figure out test driven, at least start writing some automated tests. And uh, there's different kinds of tests. Uh, you might have seen this testing pyramid. You have a, as you go up the pyramid, the bottom of the pyramid is about solid bricks of uh, software doing what you, the programmer, think they're supposed to do. Uh, and by the way, you're probably wrong about what they're supposed to do. Uh, you're going to change your mind over time. But these bricks are defined by their tests. They might do other things, but your tests say what they do. They might not say what they don't do, but that'd be nice as well. Um, now, the middle of the pyramid is supposed to say whether or not features work. Okay, so some teams will say, well, we should, if we're interested in delivering features that work to our customers, we should just focus on the middle of the pyramid. In the top is all manually tested. Um, and here there's a the base for here is wider because we're going to have more unit tests and other kinds of tests. And I'm going to tell you why uh, that's important. So if you chose to just do manual tests or tests in the middle of the pyramid, and you're testing, let's just say, a subsystem that's been integrated where there's three interacting objects that each have 10 states or complexity 10. Uh, and so if we test them together, how many possibilities are there to thoroughly test this small subsystem? If you do the math, there's a thousand tests. A thousand tests for something that simple? <laughs> no, let's let's not bother. Um, now let's draw a different picture. Okay, let's draw the picture of what if we unit tested each of those individual pieces? Hmm. Well, now we're talking about 30 tests. Now that sounds practical. A thousand sounds pretty impractical, but 30 sounds practical. And some integration tests to make sure that our things fit together properly. Hopefully some number smaller than 997, right? So that we're ahead of the game by thoroughly testing at the unit level and then testing you know, with more thought uh, at the higher levels. Uh, now, the higher level tests are important because, well, this code compiles and it links. Um, there's some use cases that might have a problem. We're misusing 
some of the interfaces, I don't know, maybe that's a global variable access. It wasn't supposed to be accessed that way. Uh, at any rate, manual test uh, is prevalent in people doing embedded systems. And a problem with that is, and if you're iterating and doing embedded, doing development in all kinds of places, if you're relying on manual test, after the first iterations, after the second iteration, you must retest the first. After the third iteration, you must retest the first two. And you can see where this is going. All right. We have an unsustainable growth. And I'm, I was being very kind. I made it linear, even though it's probably, as Mike called it, an NP problem. So it's probably a lot worse than this, but I'm just a nice guy. So, um, or play one on TV anyway. Uh, so we've got a gap, uh, the untested code gap. And I guess what's hiding in the untested code gap? Oh yes, those brush fires waiting for lightning and are gonna take off. So we have to automate tests. All right. Now TD is a challenge. It's hard to learn, but it's fun. All right, and so you will find all the, the cadence of rewards. You'll find it, it's fun. I asked people before my training classes to tell me what they like about development and what they don't like. And when we look through those, we play a, well, I suggest that some of the things that you don't like, you'll get to do less of those and you'll get to do more of the things you do like. That kind of sounds like a win to me at any rate. Um, now, technical excellence is more than just passing tests. And some of our earlier clients uh, in teaching test-driven development back 20 years ago didn't really understand the refactoring side. And refactoring is really very critical. And uh, I've been misquoting Martin for a long time on this, so I'm not going to stop now. Um, any fool can write code that the compiler understands. <laughs> now, sub uh, comment here. Uh, Martin must not work with C and C++ <laughs> because they are really hard to keep the compiler happy at any rate. Um, but it takes real skill to write code other programmers understand. Oh, hmm. All right. So what are those, you know, so we need to write code. And I've heard Mike say this a lot too. Uh, you write code once, you read it over and over and over again. That's when you spend all your time on it. So we want to write code to be optimized for people reading it. And the skills that you need, first, you got to be able to detect when something's wrong a good nose for bad code. Uh, Martin Fowler talks about those in the book. Then you got to have an idea of what would be better. And then you got to work your way towards it. And you don't do it in one big step, like Mike's trip to get another Diet Coke is not a straight line to uh, Ashley's, uh, whatever, Ashley's Diner or whatever it was, Ashley's store. Uh, you take a series of steps to get there, transformations. Right. So these are three distinct skills to learn, um, which, of course, all this stuff makes our our industry really interesting. And maybe you think code quality doesn't really matter and your bosses don't care. But they do care because bad code slows you down and bad code could have some other problems like the lawyers are coming. Um, we have the problem of a litigious society and when software is at fault, like it was for Toyota in the unintended acceleration. Um, lots of money gets paid out. Uh, there is blood in the water coming for us. If we don't get our act in order, in, if we don't get our act together, uh, we're going to be led around with a nose ring, okay? What we wanna do is get our own, get our act in order, work deliberately, work with high quality. So why doesn't your team use teaching refactoring? practices of extreme programming, we're different. Um, oh, well, yeah, you're different. Um, I mentioned to you, I work with uh, people in embedded systems and they're different. Um, they can't use TD refactoring. Their hardware is prototype and it's uh, doesn't look so great. And uh, by the way, their memory in their computers are limited like Homer Simpson's tiny brain or this watch or this pacemaker. But sometimes the memories are big, like in a GPS system or an iPhone or a large hadron detector, and they couldn't possibly use the practices of extreme programming because we've got constraints and timing, for instance, like a pacemaker, if it doesn't meet its deadline, that's not all that's going to be dead. Um, we can't use extreme programming for something like embedded or test-driven development for embedded because IO is specialized. Uh, you can't, uh, you know, you, IO like a, a washing machine or a floor cleaning robot or a, 
a pacemaker or a car or a large hadron detector. Oh yeah, we have special problems. These are expensive prototypes and they have bugs too. And uh, it's not our fault. Are you sure? Maybe it is our fault. It's specialized UIs. Okay, enough of that. Yes, you are different. Now, <laughs> I don't just work in embedded. I've, I've worked in other areas too. And the uh, insurance people have insisted that they're different. You know, embedded is special, automotive is special, health insurance software is special, web services software is special, design automation is special, financial software is special, you are special. I don't want to break it to you, but it's, it just doesn't matter. Um, well, it matters that you're special. But as far as applying ideas that work in one area to other areas is kind of what this world is about. Okay, so you can find, you're, you may be special, but a lot of the same problems exist in your work as they do in these other areas. <clears throat> so just remembering that there's a problem here getting shippable software. You know, so what's in your way? Um, dysfunctions and inadequacies. Okay, so there's Agile's three halves, right? Iterative planning, respect for people, technical excellence. Uh, me as an engineer, uh, I focus on this technical excellence side, but it is essential to help people along with it and uh, to realize that we can't just start changing the cadence of how we work without changing how we work, <laughs> Ch changing the cadence of delivery without changing how we work. Uh, oftentimes we're given uh, dates and things uh, in planning as motivational. You've heard of stretch goals and motivational scheduling and things like this. Now, um, remember I told you, I tried to avoid computers. And uh, if you think about how developers work, uh, pretty much there's almost nothing you'd rather be doing than solving these problems. You're solving them while you're sleeping, when you're playing. People will pay me for this? Oh yeah, of course. Now, learning, like Mike said, test-driven development, does take some time. So the road to success uh, does take some time. And um, no shortcuts, okay. You're gonna have to go learn the hard way. Although I'm gonna be a little bit more optimistic here. I felt like I got value on the path almost immediately. Start to shorten your cycle time with the test. Start to think about how you're going to test something. If you've got an idea, so Mike mentioned, you can't have a walking skeleton if you have an existing problem a existing uh, product develop, you have an existing code base, an existing product. Although when you're adding a new feature, you might be able to have a, uh, like a walking skeleton, try one path through that. This is how the test driven developer is going to start to think about these things is how do I start to make incremental progress? And we can develop a habit of solving problems in this incremental way. And that's about all I got to say. <laughs>